Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session called Let's Get Digital, which is the combination of physical and digital transactions taking place in retail today in an omni-channel manner. We're very pleased to have a few of our clients come and join us as panelists. We have Kathy Cockerton from Reitman's, Jeff Ronald from RW Co. Uh, we're also going to have a number of our client engagement managers, as well as the co-founder of Storeforce, Chris Matichuk, speak about their insights about what's happening within their clients in retail today. But I would like to preface the discussion with by touching on a few points that we're going to get into in more detail with the panelists uh, around this whole concept of omni-channel and, and the role, changing role of the store. You know, Storeforce started investing heavily in being able to report on and combine uh, the digital transactions and physical transactions oh, back in 2015 or so. Um, and that's because we, we intuitively understood the halo effect. And the halo effect uh, is a, coin, a term coined by the International Consortium of Shopping Centers uh, study that they did back in 2017, I think initially. But it was what happens in a particular market when you open a physical store? What happens to the online transactions? What they were able to show with a massive data set was there's a clear correlation between change in online sales and uh, opening a store. They also conversely did a study the following year that concluded that when you close the store, your e-com sales in the particular market where the store is closed went down dramatically. And that reinforces the role of the store within the market. What we found also this year, we've been through a crazy year with COVID, uh, we found that retail has changed and had to adapt faster to become more omnichannel focused than they had in the past. And, and some of the key insights that we got from our own client base is when stores reopened, people were rushing the doors to, uh, to buy, particularly if you're a younger, more trendy shopper, uh, you, you, you're much braver to get out there. The traditional sh shopper sort of started coming back later, summer and certainly into holiday. Uh, we've also found that the holiday period has been spread out and started back in October as opposed to November like it normally does. So we are seeing a, a distinct change in shopping behavior based on the statistics and what's happening with our, in our clients. One of the things that we are going to talk about is how the physical store role has changed. And uh, we'll be discussing that with some of our panelists. We also want to spend some time talking about labor planning. One of the key pieces with this switch into digital transactions now happening or part of the digital transaction happening at store level is it's obviously impacting how you plan labor, but also impacting how you uh, execute labor. So the two constants within the market of labor or the concept of labor is that retailers really need to know how much should they be spending on these digital activities and physical activities in a combined way. How much money do I have to spend? And then where and when should I spend it? So those are the, the key pieces that we'll be going through with our panelists. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you our panelists. I'm gonna start with Kathy Cockerton. Kathy, can you please introduce yourself to our viewers? Hi, I'm Kathy Cockerton, Vice President Sales and Operations for the Reitman's Division of uh, Reitman's Canada Limited. Thanks, Kathy. And Jeff? Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Ronald. I am the uh, Vice President of Sales and Operations for RW and Co. So thanks, Kathy and Jeff, for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to have you here and, and talk about uh, your experiences, particularly over the last year, which we know have been a crazy year. Um, Kathy, why don't I start with you? What has been the key uh, driver or the key change in your business in responding to the pandemic? Well, I guess lightning speed would have come to mind here in terms of how we had to respond um, post-pandemic. I mean, certainly, um, as all uh, Canadians, we um, endured the shutdown. And as we came back in, it certainly accelerated our um, post-pandemic uh, move towards uh, launching Bopis. We were fortunate that we were already fulfilling from store. That was a savior for us. Thanks, Kathy. And Jeff, um, how has this changed your IT roadmap or your runway? You know, if I had to quantify it, Dave, I would say that um, COVID has probably expedited that runway by about five years. Um, and, and the way I say five years is, you know, as, a, as an organization, we certainly 
had some idea as to how long it would take us to build our uh, e-commerce business to the level it is now at. And, and we felt that would occur over the course of a, you know, a five-year term. Well, obviously, COVID has changed everything. Uh, the shift to uh, digital purchasing for our customer out of necessity, um, first and foremost, uh, has expedited that level of e-commerce within our business uh, to the point where, you know, our percentages are getting very close to where we thought they would be five years from now. Interesting, Jeff. So you're saying that the consumer is ready to adopt all these new changes. Have you seen evidence of this in the consumer behavior? Um, so uh, I hate to say it, guys, but um, uh, from an e-com perspective, uh, the women were certainly early adapters and uh, uh, loved the new services as they roll out. Guys were a little tougher, uh, quite frankly, because we're in the unisex business. Guys were a little tougher to get, get them to embrace from an e-commerce uh, standpoint. Um, but like I said, with COVID, they really didn't have another choice. So um, they are uh, em embracing online. Uh, we, we see it in our numbers. We see it in, in their engagement numbers. And, and uh, the other thing I will say is that we're seeing in both cases um, some differences in uh, spending patterns. So uh, in, in some instances, we're seeing that they're shopping maybe a little less frequently. Um, but when they are purchasing, they're purchasing more than they were previously. So again, I think that's something that uh, will have lasting impact on the business going forward as well. Interesting, Jeff. So you're saying a lot of the changes you put in place are going to have a lasting impact. I'd like to explore that a little bit further, uh, a little bit later. Right now, I'd like to bring in Bliss. Bliss, what about what you're seeing with your clients' roadmaps? The biggest change I see is how fast you have to drive on that roadmap. Prior to the pandemic, some of the most exciting retailers out there were relative newcomers. They're exciting brands and they're growing and expanding rapidly. And they all have multi-year strategies to become true omni-channel merchants. What the pandemic did was it forced those retailers to execute in months what would have normally taken them years. The most important step I would also say in that journey is to bring all of the sales data together regardless of channel. It's the best way to develop insights of changing customer preferences as well as insights into planning labor across all channels. Thanks, Bliss. So labor planning across channel, of course, implies the digital and physical transactions at the store uh, being planned together. Kathy, can you share your thoughts on the digital and physical at store? Well, uh, you know, we're so accustomed to thinking of brick and mortar, one channel, and online, another channel. So now what we are doing is thinking of it holistically. So it becomes um, a channel. I mean, uh, really, if you just move up at the customer level, um, what channel she chooses to transact now is going to be seamless uh, for us. And we have to do it in every aspect of our business. Um, right. Not just in measuring it, but all the actions that we take around it. It's interesting. So moving up to the customer level is really about creating that seamless customer experience. Uh, Jeff, how do you see the role of the store evolving to support that? Uh, so one of the things that we're talking about uh, from an RCL perspective um, is, is really the shift from a bricks and mortar store uh, to what we're, we're coining the phrase um, OmniHub experience. Uh, so really looking at the stores holistically, you know, it's a fulfillment center, it's really a website, it's a customer service center. Um, it's, it's all of those things that go into changing the role of the store in general. So what I'm hearing, Jeff, is that the store still plays a critical role with the customer. I think from my standpoint, um, I think it's a critical path to the customer interaction. I think it is an evolution within the stores. Um, that we were headed down that path anyway, but it, it, again, COVID expedited the journey uh, to the point where it becomes the customer's interaction or, or uh, expectation, I should say, um, when they're in the stores. We know uh, from a brand perspective um, and, and from a brick and mortar perspective, that's typically where the vast majority of, of trust with a brand is established with a customer um, because it's that one on one interaction, it's that level of, of personal care. Uh, that's driving that experience in the store. So if, if we're acquiring through our bricks and mortar locations, establishing trust with the brand within the bricks and mortar locations, we were already on the path of how do we take that and then turn that customer into an omni-channel customer because we know that an omni-channel customer is 
is worth a lot more from a lifetime value perspective than a single bricks and mortar channel customer. So what role do the stores play in taking the customer or leading the customer through that journey? So Kathy, what are your thoughts in the role of the store in driving the customer experience? So, um, so people do understand the importance, not of just of the presence of the customer in the store at that moment and um, the interaction that we have personally with them, but also how that has to linger um, when she gets home, when she sits on her couch, when she goes online and, and um, has to resonate with, um, with her or him um, throughout. Thanks, Kathy. That's a great point. Uh, how you resonate with your customers long after they leave your store. Tell me, how are you getting to know your customer better? The, the journey that we're on now is, first of all, merging that data, getting a 360 data point of view. So I think that's important overall to make that um, journey uh, seamless for the consumer. Um, as she comes into the store, um, even on a promotional basis, on um, an offer, she should not feel that shopping online is a different experience than being in a store. So she should have access. Even though we might not carry every color, size, style, um, she should have access to it. So within the store, um, we do what we call store orders. So if you saw it online, we don't have it in store, no problems, we'll order it for you, you'll get it, uh, we'll ship it to you. Um, and that's been growing exponentially in our business because the consumer is seeing the broader assortment, assortment online. We don't necessarily have to carry it in store, especially when it comes to extended sizes, tall sizes, petites, um, or even in larger sizes to have access. So consumers that were limited in the past by the store that they shopped in, whether it was a lower or higher volume, um, now are, are not limited at all. They have access to um, all of the inventory. And I think that the more we put energy into those kinds of initiatives, um, the, the more seamless that experience uh, becomes. Thanks, Kathy. I think that's a great point in terms of putting more energy behind new initiatives to drive that experience. I'm going to turn it over to JF, one of our client engagement managers. What is What are you seeing out there in the market? I can speak to one of my clients' ability to pivot very quickly during the COVID lockdown and start using stores as fulfillment centers. That ability to shift gears if ever a store had to momentarily close uh, has been instrumental in their success. Stores are now acting as mini distribution centers. With the increase in volume of these ship from store activities, um, the management teams had to learn fast and come up with a new approach that allowed for an increased productivity to fulfill that volume of orders. It sounds like some of the changes are going to be permanent. Uh, Ali, what about you? What are you seeing from your client base? Really, the past year has forced retailers to find new and creative ways to get their products to their customers. One of my clients recently launched a partnership with Uber to deliver their products directly to the customer. This was another extension of their click and collect and curbside offering. Even if the store was mandated to be closed, this allowed the store to be a fulfillment center for the Uber orders, which get to their customers in two hours or less. I believe this is just the start of retailers using services built for food delivery and commuting to find new ways of reaching their shoppers. Thanks, Ali. I suppose if there is some silver lining, most of our clients are finding ways to move towards the future in omnichannel. Uh, Brian, are you finding anything with your clients that are sticking, that is processes that have changed and, and are going to be permanent now? Um, I have a client that's digitally native, and once they were forced to shut down for the pandemic, they really wanted to find a way to utilize their inside in-store staff uh, to support their online initiatives. Rather than using a call center or distribution center employee, using their in-store staff to touch and feel the product every day, they found that that increased their efficiency and their call times. And what they were able to do is use Storeforce to fund these activities. We created the specific activities so that way they could separate funding from four walls, as well as reporting. They can go back, look and see how much they spent, where they spent it, and better effectively plan that labor in the future. Um, once stores were allowed to reopen, they continued this initiative. And to this day, they're still utilizing their in-store market experts to support the online initiatives. So let me turn it back to Jeff. Jeff, are you seeing changes within RW and Co that are permanent? We research with the RCL customer. Uh, there's an appetite for both, both us and uh, curbside pickup. So uh, we are trying to do that seamlessly. We believe that um, 
you know, even after, uh, and I'll knock on wood, we get through this pandemic, um, that the behaviors that it's created in customers will last long term. Uh, so uh, if they're used to and appreciate uh, curbside pickup today, then we believe that that's something uh, they will want to continue with, maybe not to the degree they're doing it today, but it's certainly a service they will come to expect down the road. Thanks, Jeff. So with all this change happening in the stores, Kathy, are you finding that we're measuring store performance differently? It will be an um, omni perspective. So we will look at total sales. Um, so if you, again, you, you just step back to the customer um, level and look at what her uh, lifetime value uh, is in our business and what she contributes in our business as a whole. So we're, we're going to be channel agnostic, if you will, um, have one metric, one data source, um, and one way to re reward for that total um, consumer behavior. So interesting. So if you're going to measure total sales, digital and physical together, does that have any impact on compensation? Yeah, it's not, we're not expecting to increase total compensation. What we're going to do is um, spread it across all the initiatives that we have in place so that people clearly understand what they're contributing to, the work that they have to do. There was a time in brick and mortar, we'd just say sell, 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 and tasking between customers. Those days are over. There's, there's as much tasking as there is selling. And I think we have to honor that in our scheduling. We have to, people have to know that um, the customer facing moments are just as important as the tasking moments that we have. So fulfilling an order, picking uh, for BOPIS, uh, um, having a clientele uh, digital appointment, these are all tasks in the business that we have to be able to accommodate. Thanks, Kathy. So it sounds like all these digital activities are obviously impacting store labor. That brings us to our final segment. And I'd like to introduce our general manager and my co-founder of Storeforce, Chris Matterchuk, to share what she's been seeing in the market. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. The increase in digital transactions has added many new activities to the physical store, and the greatest challenge most retailers are facing is how to accommodate for that activity. There are various approaches being used, but they all start by creating new scheduling activities to plan and track. Next is a question of how to fund them. What labor planning approach should be used to allocate hours for those activities? Some have taken the approach of calculating the number of minutes per order times the number of expected orders to a daily cap. And knowing that you've got a cap on the orders, that's how much labor the store will receive. The flaw with that though, is that you don't know if on any given day, a store is gonna hit their order max. And so you may be funding hours into a store that are not necessary. We also have some clients who are starting to look at in-store sales combined with some level of digital sales activity. This might be crediting ship from store orders or geolocating online sales. Now that gives them a total store sales number that is higher than what just the four walls business would have been. By using that sales volume, the store natively is generating additional hours because their sales volume is greater than what the physical only would be. We certainly have introduced the concept of available capacity to our clients. This allows for some funding of activities within your existing schedule. So within Storeforce, we can show you within your existing schedule where you have available capacity for the store to be doing some tasking, including activities like filling ship from store orders. Regardless of the approach you select, you want to ensure that the digital activity does not disrupt your in-store customer. Thanks, Chris. So it sounds like the key challenge is moving from a fixed number of digital transactions through today to a variable number of digital transactions a day. Uh, Jeff, can you share what's going on at RW and Co? It was a hell of a lot simpler when there were 30 orders a day. <laughs> but, but that's not our reality now. Um, so I think the other thing that we're looking at holistically moving forward is how do we how do we allocate hours or allocate our, our wage spend um, in our new reality, where we're going to be next year. So uh, to Kathy's point, that's where we're starting to look at things like uh, market sales, 
um, as as part of that. How do we how would we allocate our wage cost based on market sales? Because we do believe that market sales should encompass, in theory, should encompass both what we're doing from a bricks and mortar perspective, uh, but also what we're doing. Uh, from a demand sales perspective and a quick find perspective all in one number as opposed to having our teams in the field as they are today try to almost manage two wage budgets. Right. Today they're, they're managing their allowable hours based on their bricks and mortar sales and they're managing their allowable hours based on the number of orders they're receiving. Um, we're trying to tie it all up in one nicely arranged bow so that here it is. Uh, easier said than done, I know. Thanks, Jeff. I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of understanding how to fund stores. Traditionally, it's been done based on what sales were. Uh, and now that there's digital and, and physical sales taking place in the same place, how do you uh, give credit for a sale? Uh, we're almost out of time. Um, turn it over to you, Kathy, for last thoughts. How are you funding? I know you're doing a lot of these quick find, uh, which is endless aisle transactions in the store. How are you funding labor? through the recognition of a sale? So they are treated um, like in-store transactions, actually, in our world. So that, even though it's fulfilled online in another store, because we didn't have the inventory in the original store, um, they are still getting credit for that sale in the store um, because they've keyed that into their POS, so we track it as such. Uh, thanks, everyone. That's all the time we have. Now moving on to our Q&A. Hi everyone and thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed uh, the session. We now have a few minutes for Q&A and I'm just gonna work through some of the questions that were sent in during the session, but feel free to continue to drop me questions. The first question I'm actually gonna direct to Kathy. Um, have your stores found it challenging to balance the different behaviors in store? So the behaviors between providing a positive in-store experience for the customer that is there versus at the same time being efficient in pick and pack activity, um, or are you separating those roles within the store? Well, yeah, it has been a challenge to try to adapt to the different um, activities that were required. Um, we are doing uh, better planning um, uh, calendars for ourselves and trying to separate those activities. Uh, but we don't, uh, every employee in the store has a certain level of competency or capabilities to manage all of the activities that we ask in stores. And where we're finding our efficiency throughout is by um, clearly identifying what are the best times, the downtime. Um, that they can conduct those activities in. And that's really where the skill set is all about, is to get to that right place where you balance when is the best time to fulfill. Uh, when the customers are in the store, obviously we have to deal with them in terms of peak segments and, and how to drop the tasking at the, that moment. So it's, it's a very um, intense balancing act in terms of planning. So are you really looking at the non-peak times for the stores then to focus on the pick and pack? Absolutely. We, we dig for them so that uh, we are opportunistic in um, getting to all of those tasks that are, are required in terms of fulfillment. Great, thanks. Uh, question for Jeff, and actually I think this is so interesting. As, as the operation has changed, have you made any changes to uh, physically to the store to support the change in Omnichannel? Uh, great question. Um, so the bottom line is, yes, we are evolving the look and feel of our stores uh, on a constant basis. Certainly when we moved to um, pick and pack from store and shipping from store, uh, we had to introduce um, a station within the store to make sure that we were eligible or, or able to uh, process those um, packages. Uh, we also had to look at storage facilities, et cetera, at that point in time to make sure that we could accommodate uh, in a secure way uh, those packages before they were picked up uh, by the courier. Um, similarly, as we move forward to introduce uh, things like a focus in-store, uh, we also have to take a look at the physical space uh, in-store as well for the processing 
of uh, those BOPIS orders. And if we are to offer our BOPIS customer an expedited level of service, how do we do that within the space that we have available today? Yeah, it's interesting. I've had a conversation with some of my clients also about do we separate the areas of the store for digital activity versus physical customer? And, and you know, putting us all in one lineup, is that really the right answer? And I think everybody's still sort of exploring it. The other thing that came to mind for me was it wasn't long ago that, you know, as we built stores, we were reducing bathroom sizes, right? To a more selling floor. And now I guess you're challenged to swing that back a little bit, I assume. Yeah, you know, certainly back room is something that we're looking at, but, but you know, I could certainly envision a focus a storage unit uh, toward the front of the store. Because again, some people that are coming in for BOPIS, for instance, don't necessarily want to interact with anybody. They're doing it for speed of pickup. So they just want the ability to walk in and, and walk out very quickly. So you want to make sure that they have ready access to that. I think the other thing that we have to keep in mind from a store design perspective is, in a lot of cases, we built these massive uh, cash areas in most stores. Uh, so you were driving all the traffic to one single area within the store. That's not necessarily the right approach going forward where you may choose to have a cash station towards the back, a BOPA station towards the front, a fulfillment sa a station somewhere else. So um, all of those things we need to look at moving forward as the evolving needs of the customer uh, change. All right, maybe I'll just stay with you for the next slide as well. Um, as a customer in your store, how have you made your customer aware of the extended inventory uh, that is available to them now through, you know, online, in-store online? So one of the first things, obviously, is through point of purchase or marketing within the store. We certainly uh, market to the customer and let them know on our marketing that we do have extended sizes and extended colors uh, online as well. The other thing that we are doing with our customers today is we're utilizing our online inventory and, and the staff are utilizing iPads within the store to go to the website so that as they're shopping with the customer and interacting with the customer, they can show them other styles, other colors, other assortment that are online. And we give the customer the ability to place an order for that online uh, color, for instance, or size that we don't have immediately in the store uh, right then and there during their interaction. Great. Um, Kathy, I want to come back to uh, the, the change in how you're measuring stores and how that's going to impact also, you know, compensation, I think was the word that was used, but really, you know, thinking about how we incentivize the store. How did you communicate the change uh, to your management teams or was there training that was needed to help them understand the impact that they had on the overall business? Oh, for sure. There's some training that is required and there's a learning curve for everybody. Um, these are a group of people that have um, for many, many years just been concerned about what happens uh, within the four walls of their, their store. So um, uh, giving them a broader view on the customer behavior outside of the brick and mortar is part of that learning curve. And certain behaviors that uh, we have, in, including getting them engaged in social media, including um, having them participate in that journey that the customer is now uh, being exposed to. So there is training that is required um, and uh, moving them to what we call market sales. So that total view is part of the process that we are currently engaging in now to get them there to also compensate them for uh, total sales so that, that they understand that their job is, is certainly to make that environment pleasing for the customer when she comes in that day, but that it also extends to when she leaves the business and how she um, is going to feel about that experience and continue to shop with us online and or any of our um, uh, channels. Great, thank you very much. We are almost out of time. It's unfortunate we have a lot of questions uh, that we were not able to get to, but I want to thank both Kathy and Jeff uh, for joining us today and, and, and Dave as well for um, uh, participation in the video and thank you.